Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Trevor Bernard. I'm the director of the Wilberforce Institute and the professor of slavery and emancipation uh, at the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today uh, on this um, unusual um, webinar, but it's unusual in, in the way that everything nowadays is unusual. Uh, but this is to the Alderman Sidney Smith annual lecture, uh, which is one of the, is, is a highlight of the year uh, for the Wilberforce Institute. Um, and, 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 and we're delighted uh, to welcome you all here today. Um, just to say a little bit about the Alderman Sidney Smith annual lecture, who Alderman Sidney, Sidney Smith was, uh, and what, it, what, what this lecture is in relationship to the University of Hull. Uh, it's the most prestigious uh, history uh, seminar at the University of Hull, um, and derives from an endowment which was given by uh, Alderman Sidney Smith, who was not only an alderman, but also mayor of Hull uh, in 1940, uh, and MP for one of the Hull districts between 1945 and 1950. Uh, the lecture series that is in his honour was initiated in 1972, uh, went into abeyance in the late 1980s, uh, and was restarted again under the, uh, thanks largely thanks to Mike Turner uh, and David Richardson, both very closely connected to the Wilberforce Institute, uh, started again in 2010. Uh, it's a very distinguished uh, distinguished uh, uh, speaker uh, lecture, um, and the list of speakers at this event is a virtual who's who of famous historians uh, in Britain, particularly those historians working in social and economic history. Asa Briggs, E.P. Thompson, Eric Hobsbawm, uh, and Christopher Hill. And one of the previous speakers in this series uh, is, is someone who's perfect, who links together uh, the older, older notion of the Sydney Smith's lect annual lecture and its recent reincarnation as, as a lecture which is connected very much to the issues of historical slavery and emancipation, which are the themes of the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, Catherine Hall gave the gave the uh, who's now Professor Emerita at U University College London, uh, gave the Sydney Smith Lecture in 2013. And I'll just mention a couple of things about Catherine, who is going to be, give the commentary today, uh, who's she's an extremely distinguished historian of British social history, especially the emergence and nature of the middle class, uh, and even more so a pioneer in women's and gender history, and in, in, in recent times has been uh, doing a superb work, uh, both as a director of the legacies of British slavery uh, and also in terms of her academic uh, academic work, which is very extensive uh, as an expert in British imperial history uh, and Britain's extensive links of slavery. Uh, we can't think of anyone more ideal than Catherine uh, to comment uh, on John's paper. And it's a great pleasure to me as the, as the, as the Wilberforce director uh, to introduce John Oldfield, uh, the former director of the Wilberforce Institute. Um, before I say so, just say a couple of things about this lecture, which of course is an exceptional lecture, both in good and bad ways. Uh, the bad ways are obvious, uh, the constrained circumstances uh, that we now live under. Um, and it's a matter of enormous regret to me personally and to the Wilberforce Institute uh, generally uh, that, uh, that we cannot do this lecture in our beautiful chambers, Oriel Chambers in the old town of Hull, and we cannot entertain you as guests and John Oldfield, particularly as our distinguished speaker, uh, in the ways that they should be entertained. Um, but it's also an exceptional lecture uh, in very good ways because it's honouring one of our own, uh, someone who is a worthy ad addition uh, to the list of distinguished Sydney Smith lecturers and someone who is beloved uh, within the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, John, educated at Cambridge, taught briefly at Leicester, uh, then for, for 20 years, over 20 years, at the University of Southampton, uh, came to the Wilberforce Institute in 2013. He was already then uh, the leading scholar in this country on the history of abolitionism, uh, particularly on the transatlantic links between Britain and America from the late 1780s uh, through the mid 19th century. Uh, and what he's going to be talking about today uh, is a perfect subject, uh, combining his long experience uh, within in the field of abolitionism and transatlantic popular culture. Uh, John is very much still attached to the Institute. Uh, we should make, make, make that very clear. He's on the staff of the Institute and is continuing to do 
a considerable amount of work uh, on his particular areas of expertise, uh, transatlantic abolitionism, uh, popular culture, and the topic of emancipation in Britain and America generally. Um, the book that is part of the, that we, we celebrate today, The Ties That Bind, uh, which, is, which, is, which deals with a lot of the things that John talks about today, uh, is the second of two books that he's written on the international history of anti-slavery. Uh, the first book, Transatlantic Abolitionism in the Age of Revolution, uh, covered the tumultuous years between 1787 and 1820. And the second book, just published this last September, uh, deals with transatlantic abolitionism uh, between 1820 and 1865. Uh, the ties that bind concerns the close affinities that bound together anti-slavery activists in Britain and the United States of America, demonstrating the, the, the role that abolition played uh, not only in, in regard to advancing emancipation, uh, but also in regard to creating a vibrant and broad-based political culture in the middle decades of the 19th century uh, in both countries. It looks, it looks at unusual sources, including songs and musical performances, and sheds light on the large topic of why some modern social political movements succeed and others do not. Uh, and, and if you have not had the chance to, to purchase this book, uh, I thoroughly recommend it. I'm, I'm well on my way in, in looking at it, and it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, in today's talk, John draws on his immense knowledge of anti-slavery in Britain uh, to offer a comprehensive re-evaluation re of, our his, of, of, of the current historiographical moment in the history of abolitionism. Uh, and I'll leave it now to John to, to talk to you about this very important subject, uh, one which he is a, 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 a world expert, uh, which is on re-evaluating uh, British abolitionism. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, i just begin by saying how de delighted I am to have been invited to give this lecture. Uh, it's a very um, neat way of bookending my career, which, as you say, began with my inaugural at Hull in 2014. Uh, and um, it's especially pleasing that Catherine is being, has been able to join us today. I'm not going to talk too much about the ties that bind, um, but I will be referring to it uh, as we go along. What I'd like to do is really talk about something a little bit more broad and, and general, um, something that perhaps is more befitting of what, after all, is a public lecture. In the past 10 or 12 years, I think there's been a discernible shift in our understanding and appreciation of the history of slavery and abolition. We can trace this back, I think, to the bicentenary of the Slave Trade Abolition Act of, two, of 1807, which in Catherine Hall's words, kick-started a national conversation on slavery and the politics of race. While 2007 has often been dismissed as a Wilberfest or a Wilber farce, and this was certainly true in terms of the official discourse, something else, I think, was going on below the surface. As we discovered when putting together the Remembering 1807 digital archive, many of the 300 plus projects sponsored by the Heritage Lottery Fund and others in 2007 had nothing to do with abolition, but instead traced the slave trade links of British towns and cities, many of them hitherto unknown, or tackled the leg legacies of slavery in terms of prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Equally striking was the emphasis on resistance and what the enslaved did to free themselves, both in the Caribbean and the United States. Other projects celebrated the black presence in Britain or else sought to identify and preserve black archives. In other words, the local response to 2007-1807 was much more complex and certainly more multifaceted and might at first have seemed apparent. And since 2007, this inquiry has continued apace. I wanted to just very briefly talk about three factors here. The first of them is, I think, the influence of curators and museums, especially so-called slavery museums. Wilberforce House Museum in Hull, the ISM in Liverpool, London Docklands Museum 
Now, I'm well aware that the, there have been critics of those exhibitions and they have weaknesses, but I do think that collectively this endeavor has reshaped our understanding of slavery and abolition, not least when it comes to representations of Africa, i.e. Uh, not as a place where people went to buy, to buy slaves, but as a rich and vibrant culture. Uh, and in particular, the horrors of the Middle Passage and the plantation system itself. The second thing I would draw attention to is digital archives. And I just mentioned two very briefly. One of them is the Slave Voyages Project, the brainchild of my colleague, David Richardson, which laid bare the extent of Britain's um, involvement in the transatlantic slavery uh, and give us, gave us, I think, a very precise idea of what we were dealing with. And just to remind people, one of the startling conclusions, I think, of, of David's work was that we, what we were talking about was 3.4 million people, or roughly 50% of all the enslaved Africans shipped from Africa to the Americas between 1662 and 1807. That was the extent of Britain's involvement. So this was a landmark, uh, I think, contribution to these debates about Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slavery. No less influential has been the legacies of British slave ownership project, which as many of you will know, sheds important light on who exactly benefited from the 20 million pounds in compensation paid out to slaveholders as a result of emancipation in 1833. And not least the compensation received by some 4,000 absentees who lived in Britain and benefited directly from slavery. LBS has inspired countless local and regional studies of slavery. It has also informed the work of Heritage England on slavery and the built environment, and the National Trust's recent report on the slave trade and or colonial links of many of its properties. And I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that but for that report, uh, but for that work on LBS, we wouldn't have been able to, that re report would not have been able to be prepared. The third thing I would draw attention to is the growth of black history, black British history. Again, inspired by many local initiatives, initiatives in Brixton, Leeds, Liverpool, Hull, and the organization of the Brack uh, Curriculum Project led by Dr. Lavinia Stennett. Working closely with local archives and schools, these initiatives have helped to shed new light on the black presence in Britain before, during, and after the era of the transatlantic slave trade. And I'll have uh, more to say about that literature uh, as I go on. So we have, I think, huge amount of activity, and I, it, it's, I think, probably worth saying at this point that there's, uh, I'm in no way suggesting that that work is complete. It's an ongoing analysis, an ongoing project, and much more work needs to be done. My point is rather that the growing emphasis on Britain's slave past requires us to think, rethink the boundaries of anti-slavery. This is not simply a question of asking, where does abolition fit in? And some might argue that in the past, abolition has received more than enough attention, but rather of coming up with a version of British anti-slavery that has purchase, relevance, and meaning. Now, at this point, I want to take a short detour and say a few words about the United States. Now, I'm well aware that there are some obvious continu discontinuities here. While slavery in Britain was invariably seen as a colonial issue, in the United States, it was a pressing domestic issue, which was to have fatal consequences for the American Republic. This emphasis is reflected in the historical literature, which has generated successive ways of revisionist and counter-revisionist uh, studies of slavery, as well as an ongoing preoccupation with the origins, ideologies, and structures of American abolitionism. In a sense, these have always been seen as two sides of the same coin, and, and I think in many cases taught as such. One of the noticeable trends here has been the growing preoccupation with black resistance, both among slave communities in the South and free black communities in the North. 
it is sometimes easy to forget, but on the eve of the, of the American Civil War, there were some 250,000 free blacks in the United States, most of whom were scattered across the northeastern seaboard in cities such as New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. As many of you will be aware, the origins of those communities were in the, what's often referred to as the first emancipation, which took place during and after the American Revolution. By 1810, if not before, most of these communities were highly organized with their own churches, Masonic lodges, self-help societies, and so on, and had developed their own social structures, including a black elite led mainly by clergymen, but also educators and business leaders. They'd also become politically literate, expressing their grievances via autobiography, sermons, petitions, and lawsuits demanding free and equal rights as American citizens and resisting efforts to forcibly deport them, which was a real fear following the organization of the American Colonization Society in 1816. Work on these communities has in turn influenced broader thematic studies of American anti-slavery. Manisha Sinha's prize winning The Slaves' Cause, published in 2016, puts forward what she describes as an integrated history of the American abolitionist movement. All of the usual suspects are there, from William Lloyd Garrison to Garrett Smith to Abraham Lincoln, but so too are the voices of countless black activists, whether those like Frederick Douglass, who were recognized as black leaders, or those much less well known who pursued freedom suits through the courts or added their voices to anti-slavery petitions, or those in the South who ran away or engaged in resistance against plantation slavery. With that in mind, I think it's relevant to ask what might an integrated history of British anti-slavery look like? So going back to that question of black perspectives, which I think are important to this question, as I said earlier, we now have a great deal more, we, or we know a great deal more than we ever did about the black presence in Britain during the 18th and 19th centuries. Figures like Alado Equiano figure prominently in, the, in these narratives. So too do Otava Cucuano, Ignatius Sancho, Mary Prince, and Robert Wedderburn. But behind these personalities and who get a lot of attention, there were countless others who are only now being restored to view. Projects like Africans in Yorkshire, led by Gufty Burroughs, have opened our eyes to the life experiences of those who settled in Britain, as well as the many others who came as visitors, whether sailors, missionary, teachers, or activists. Not all of these men and women were abolitionists, but their presence alone attests to the staying power of the black community, as well as its impact on British society. Hannah Rose Murray's new book makes this same point, in her case through an in-depth study of the 80 or more African Americans who visited Britain between 1830 and 1865, among them Frederick Douglass, William Wells Brown, and Sarah Parker Ramond. These black visitors brought immediacy and authenticity to the anti-slavery movement their speeches thrilled and amazed British audiences. When William Wells Brown spoke at the town hall in Southampton in January 1853, the crowds were so large that many people had to be turned away. Douglas was more popular still. During his 19-month first tour of Britain in 1845-46, he gave over 300 lectures, helping to rouse anti-slavery feeling in the UK at a time when in organizational terms, the movement seemed to be in decline. It's my view, and my increasingly, that we need to pay much more attention to these voices. And I think that's a challenge for all of us. We also need to set British anti-slavery in its appropriate international context. And this has been a theme of my own work, as, as uh, Trevor pointed out earlier in two books, I've been looking at very closely at this whole question of what is often referred to as transatlanticism. Now to provide a context here, there is a tendency, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic to view abolition in national terms. 
in Britain's case, as a cornerstone of the nation's tradition of humanitarian interventionism, in the USA's case, as a further proof of American exceptionalism. But as I've argued elsewhere, anti-slavery was never a parochial British affair any more than it was a parochial American affair. Instead, it rested on dense networks that linked together activists on both sides of the Atlantic. Cell-style citizens of the universe, early anti-American activists in particular, were keenly aware of the fact that theirs was an international endeavor aimed at ushering in a new era that was synonymous with the triumph of enlightenment values. And many of those assumptions go on. William Lloyd Garrison, who again I talk a lot about in the ties of Bind, saw himself as an international figure. He was very, very proud of his transatlantic connections and the ties that bound him in particular to people like George Thompson. So these perspectives, I think, are important, but I would go further. The abolitionist movement was acutely responsive to international events and not least to events in the Caribbean. Let me give uh, an example. As many of you will know, the campaign against the slave trade fell into two distinct phases, the second of which began in 1804. Why 1804? This was not simply a whim on Wilberforce's part, but rather a response to events on the other side of the Atlantic. In this case, the emergence of Haiti, for, formerly Saint-Domingue, as an independent black republic. There are important geopolitical considerations at play here, not least the security of the British Caribbean islands, chief among them, Jamaica. Anti-slavery activists drew what seemed to them the obvious lesson namely that the revolt in Saint-Domingue had been caused by the colony's over-reliance on fresh imports of enslaved Africans. In a widely circulated pamphlet, Henry Broome, a key uh, strategist, spelled out what he saw as the choices facing Britain, either, and to quote him, to surrender the slave trade or to risk losing everything. And it's just worth, I think, quoting him at greater length. He goes on to say this, and I quote, if we put off doing what every call of duty and every view of interest so imperiously enjoin, in all human probability, that consummation will have taken place, which has already been partially accomplished, and the abolition of the slave trade will have been affected by the utter destruction of the colonial system. Now, this idea of abolishing the slave trade in order to preserve slavery might seem an odd position for abolitionists to take, but it allowed them to portray themselves as the real patriots in what was an increasingly fraught debate, and it undoubtedly won over many waverers, including some slave holders. Considerations like these pushed Britain ever closer towards abolition, the Foreign Slave Trade, a Foreign Slave Act of 1805, for instance, was essentially a, a war measure designed to stifle the economic interest of Britain's enemies, principally the French. It is noteworthy, for instance, that in introducing the bill in the House of Commons, the Attorney General, Sir Arthur Piggott, mentioned the word humanity just once, instead stressing the wider political implications of the measure. And the final push in 1807, was they made that much easier, I would argue, by the knowledge that the USA was about to abolish its own international slave trade, as set out under the terms of the US Constitution. The point is that this course of events from 1804 to 1807 was set in motion by events in the Caribbean, or what Julia Scott memorably called the common wind, currents of a communication and action that swirled across and within the Atlantic world during the 18th and 19th century. Much the same applies to the later campaign against British colonial slavery, where again, black resistance, in this case, a series of slave revolts, echoed across the Atlantic world, in, in, uh, increasing calls for reform. While we know an increasing amount about these revolts from Demerara in 1823 to Jamaica in 1831, more arguably needs to be done to integrate them 
into broader histories of British anti-slavery. And the forthcoming bicentenary of the Demerara Slave Revolt in, in 2023 will, I think, give us an opportunity to put down a marker of sorts that points to that need to integrate those slave revolts in broader narratives of British anti-slavery. I want to say something about two other themes. The first of these is pro-slavery thought. Now, this might not come as a surprise. Historians have long recognized the importance of the West India interest, both inside and outside Parliament. As Andrew O'Shaughnessy has argued, the powerful London Society of West Indian planters and merchants was closely linked with the City of London, as well as with MPs, some of them like William Beckford, who, who were themselves absentee planters. But more recently, Paula Dumas has drawn our attention to what she describes as a distinct pro-slavery culture in the UK, evident in such things as newspapers, journals, poems, novels, prints, and article, artifacts that in many ways were as influential as anti-slavery culture. Two things I think follow from this. The first is that we need to see these competing narratives, pro-slavery and anti-slavery, in dialogue with each other, which is essentially the point that Srividya Swaminathan makes in her landmark book, Debating the Slave Trade, published in 2009. The second relates to chronology and the success of pro-slavery interest in slowing down the progress of reform. This was not simply a matter of uh, delay, uh, however, but I think the coalescence of important interest around certain fixed points, one of them being the, the issue of compensation. Another was the assumption that 1807, when Britain had abolished the slave trade, represented a political settlement of sorts, meaning that any attempt to interfere with colonial slavery was regarded as a, be a breach of trust. This is a problem, I think, that bedeviled William Wilberforce and others um, after 1807. Uh, time and time again, as he's inching towards new initiatives, pro-slavery interests keep pulling him back to 1807 and pointing out that in 1807, he had said that he, he, it was not his intention to interfere with slavery. It was only about the slave trade. And this becomes a constant theme. You look at debates around the Slave Registry Bill in 1816 or the creation of the Anti-Slavery Society in 1823. This discourse, this pro-slavery discourse, which is about the meaning of 1807 as a, as a kind of political settlement, is very, very clear and loud. And it's a central plank of pro-slavery uh, thinking. Intriguingly, the corollary to this uh, is that it was not unusual for some 19th century MPs to speak wistfully about the merits of the Abolition Act of 1807, while at the same time drawing the line at the abolition of slavery, particularly if that meant immediate measures of some kind. A distinction, I think, that is perhaps as confusing now as it was at the time, and I think some of the discourse currently about around Black Lives Matter and, and the behavior of MPs in the 19th century touches on that kind of confusion um, that you could apparently ab uh, support the abolition of slave trade, but not the abolition of slavery. The second theme uh, is the need for what I would call big narratives. In his last book, Before He Died, Ira Berlin made a plea for us to think of emancipation more in terms of a long durée. What he meant by this specifically was the need to integrate the two phases of the abolitionist movement. The 18th century campaign against the slave trade on the one hand, and the later campaign, which was much more familiar certainly to American audiences, the later campaign against slavery. So Berlin was calling, uh, making a plea for these to be again integrated uh, and in a sense, we can make the same point about the British historiography. Here again, there is a, perhaps a tendency to see these as two separate campaigns, 1807, 1833. 
when in reality they were both part of what Berlin calls the long emancipation. But we might go further. 1833 might have been a significant turning point, but is it no more represented an end than did 1807. British manufacturers went on importing slave-produced U.S. cotton well into the 1850s. Meanwhile, in the Caribbean, post-1833, many planters shifted to Indian indentured labor, an exploitative system that was only finally abandoned in 1920. There were similar abuses in the East African protectorate, what is now Kenya, where slavery and the slave trade were prevalent until 1907, despite ongoing British oversight of the colony. This, I think, is an important perspective, the ongoing nature of what we're talking about. The flip side, of course, was that abolitionist activity went on too. We sometimes forget, but the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, what later became Anti-Slavery International, was organized in 1839. As James Hartfield's recent history makes clear, the BFAS um, exercised an influence that far outweighed its numerical strength. Many of its positions, moreover, not least on the American Civil War, might strike us today as seeming strange and contradictory. But the wider point is that neither slavery nor abolition came to a southern end in 1833-38. The struggle went on, and in many instances still goes on. I have two further thoughts. One relates to what is usually called popular abolitionism, and this is something that um, I myself was heavily involved in. Um, my first, first major book on this whole subject, Popular Politics and British Anti-Slavery, um, set out to answer a question, how was it that abolitionists were able to raise public awareness about this issue, to turn an idea effectively into a, a movement? And this was part of that um, inquiry was about shifting the attention away from what was going on in Parliament to what was going on in the country. And this was all about, therefore, looking much more about petitioning and the process of petitioning, how were petitions organized, who was, before, who was behind them, how, in, if you like, how did abolitionists create a constituency for anti-slavery? Um, and, and that as part of that agenda was really about, as I say, shifting attention away from people like Wilberforce uh, to the wider movement outside Parliament. Now that work, I think, has snowballed. There are, I think there are lots of people working in that area, uh, including literary scholars, art, art historians, and others. And as a result of that, we probably now know more now than we ever did about that 18th century movement, the petitioning campaigns of the 1780s and the 90s, and also, I think, the period up to 1807. We know, we know more than we ever did about grassroots organization, the relationship between anti-slavery and patterns of consumption, and about anti-slavery culture broadly defined. All of this, I think, um, is, has been a massive achievement, but we arguably, arguably know less about the 19th century movement or about groups like the Agency Committee, organized in 1831, which pioneered the use of anti-slavery lecturers, uh, often referred to as agents, and the pledging of MPs, literally a process of writing to MPs and say, will you support abolition? If you will, I will vote for you. If you won't implicitly, then I'm not gonna, I'm gonna vote for somebody else. These are tactics, I think, which, which I talk about at some length in the Ties of Bowen, but what they signify is, I think, the emergence of a new kind of politics, at once loud, vibrant, and confrontational. It's in that period that, in a sense, you can start really talking about uh, abolition as something taking to the streets. Um, the use of placards and, and what's referred to as placarding, the kind of visual identity, to it, pasting up things in the streets to draw people's attention to anti-slavery. All of this, I think, is synonymous, as I say, with this kind of almost a new era. Uh, 
in anti-slavery politics. And it's all about extending that work around popular politics. But I think more work needs to be done around that kind of activity, particularly the agency committee. And it's surprisingly, when I started working on the anti-slavery anti committee, I was surprised at how, how much little, how little had actually been written about what actually turned out to be a hugely influential organization. So I think more work needs to be done in those areas. Also, I think um, more work needs to be done on anti-slavery leadership, which brings us on to William Wilberforce. Now, um, by way of contextualizing what I'm about to say, um, a lot of my attention uh, in the framing this, this talk has been thinking towards a 2033 which will mark the bicentenary of the abolition of colonial slavery in the British Caribbean. Now it's worth stressing that 2033 will also mark the bicentenary of the death of William Wilberforce. In fact, William Wilberforce died within days of the final bill going through the British House of Commons. And there's always been, I think, an interesting congruence between those two, two things. If you look back at 1933, when the nation paused to commemorate the centenary uh, of um, 1833, um, there's, there's sometimes, I think, a, a kind of, not so much attention, but a, a, a tendency on the one, well, what, what are we doing? Are, are we commemorating Wilberforce? Or are we commemorating the abolition of British colonial slavery in the Caribbean? And I think that kind of uh, inquiry is going to surround the way in which we think about 2033 and i'll come back to that in a minute now within that context i think there is a need to reevaluate wilberforce uh, particularly his career between 1807 and 1826 when he formally resigned as an mp people don't often realize that that wilberforce resigned in, in 1826 he wasn't there when the, the final victory took place um, uh, in fact, he'd, he'd gone. Um, now, I think that needs to be thought about. Um, uh, and we need to also consider a, a couple of other things, I think, without going into too much detail, but detail. One of them, I think, is Wilberforce's relationship with James Stephen and Zachary Macaulay, his two walking sticks, as George Stephen uh, described them as. What kind of a relationship was that? I mean, does he defer to them too much? Does he guide them? Does he, who, how does that relation work? And that relates to something else, which is, I think, the need to think critically about what kind of politician Wilberforce was. We know he's a great orator, but you know, we perhaps don't always think about him as a politician, his effectiveness, his strengths, and his weaknesses. Now, this, I think, the encouraging um, <laughs> uh, message here is that there's a lot of work going on around Wilberforce, um, particularly um, by John Co Coffey and his team at Leicester, who are transcribing and will eventually publish Wilberforce's diaries. And I think this is going to be a hugely significant moment. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that that work will bring, bring give us a greater insight into Wilberforce's motivations, um, particularly between 1807 and 1826, and in so doing, bring him out of the shadow of his son's gushing and arguably overstated biography, originally published in 1838. But returning to what I was saying just a minute ago, of course, Wilberforce isn't the only person here. Uh, what about his successors? What do we know about them? What do we know about Thomas Val Buxton, for instance, who was nominally the leader of this campaign? Um, I think some of us might be hard pressed to come up with some kind of um, information, some fleshing out of, you know, well, who was Thomas Val, Val Buxton, other than perhaps being aware that there's a memorial to him on Victoria Embankment Gardens, which you know politicians often peer in front of uh, regularly on our screens. But Buxton arguably needs to be recovered. Um, 
And one other thing I think that is arguably important about the whole abolitionist narrative is to think about, I think critically, about how the names of people like Wilberforce and Clarkson and Granville Sharp, for that matter, resonated among transatlantic communities, including black communities that often appropriated the names of these people uh, for their own political purposes, weaving them into a kind of black protest memory. Uh, and I talk about this at some length in um, The Ties That Bind, this whole phenomenon of black Anglophilia, which really only makes sense if you understand the depths of Anglophobia uh, in 19th century America, so that appropriating somebody like Wilberforce suddenly becomes an act of considerable bravery. And in doing so, um, as, a, as a member of a black community, those communities I mentioned earlier, you 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 often put your life at risk and we know that black communities were were, were um, ransacked by anti-abolitionist mobs uh, during the 1830s and the 1840s but what's interesting i think is how wilberforce clark clarkson and shock resonate in those communities uh, and have a kind of traction which i think is very very telling and that again i think is part of this broader transatlantic study or narrative that I'm trying to tell and that I think needs more attention, uh, particularly as we move ever closer to 2033. The other thought, um, and I'll put it no stronger than that, relates to a perennial question, which is the relationship between anti-slavery and capitalism. Uh, those of you who listened in to our webinar on Bronwyn Everill's new book, will know that she has opened up a new way of looking at this, I think, that is through the lens of ethical capitalism, legitimate commerce, free produce, free trade, free labor. In doing so, she has pointed intriguingly, I think, to another kind of integrated history. At the same time, however, we need to know more about who the abolitionists were. Uh, not least in terms of their economic interests and perspectives. Richard Hussey's work on petitions and petitioning may well help us to get closer to answering some of these questions, enabling us to chart with more precision the link between industrial capitalism and anti-slavery. Um, uh, and I think um, this is an extremely important inquiry. However, it's not to suggest that the spread of abolitionist ideas had to rest on the growth of the factory system or indeed the rise of free labor ideology. Or, although the idea that there was some kind of link there, perhaps a transformation of consciousness, to quote David Bryan Davis, now seems indisputable. Uh, and I think uh, going back to the legacies of British slave ownership, I think that work opens up some new opportunities for people working on British anti-slavery, not least thinking about that relationship, thinking about this whole idea of, you know, were there two, in fact, two Brit uh, British middle classes, one linked much more to empire and trade and commerce, the other much more linked to industrialization and manufacturing and how anti-slavery um, plays across those kinds of interests and there's something I think to be gained I think for, for us to start thinking about how all of this fits together. Now that's a very broad agenda I know I touched on a lot of things there and uh, and perhaps skated over some some nuances that will be obvious to many of the people listening but what I've tried to sketch out here is I think is this idea that we need to um, rethink the contours of British anti-slavery. What I'm proposing uh, is in effect a more, to borrow Manisha Sinha's word, a more integrated account of British anti-slavery. One that is more flexible, inclusive, and more attuned to the wider domestic and international context in which anti-slavery activists operated. So that's, in a sense, the agenda. And it's an important agenda, I think, because of 2033. As we move ever closer 
to 2033, the bicentenary of both Wilberforce's death and the Emancipation Act of, 2030, of, of 1833, the question of who and what we want to commemorate will become more urgent and pressing. And it will become, I think, um, particularly for people working in the museum sector and in educa education gently, there will be, I think, a, an increasing need to think through this uh, and what we want to do. So to put that a different way, negotiating this double anniversary is likely to prove challenging. But if we are to put it off, we need a history of British anti-slavery that is fit for purpose, something that allows us to commemorate the achievements of anti-slavery activists, William Wilberforce included, while at the same time recognizing Britain's deep and tragic involvement in both the slave trade and the wider business of slavery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for that very rich, very satisfying and very thought provoking paper. And I'm sure that it will provoke a lot of questions from uh, from our audience. Um, can I can I just uh, remind people or, or or mention to people that if you have questions, and, and John would be delighted to to hear them, uh, if you could put them in the chat function uh, of of this program platform, uh, that would be great. If, if you look at the if you go to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see an orange arrow. If you press that orange arrow, you will see a chat function. If you could write questions in that chat function, uh, that would be terrific. And I can then um, relay them to John uh, for discussion afterwards. Um, I also want to mention uh, two future webinars we have. I'll mention these at the end uh, of, the, of our uh, webinar today as well, but, but some people might be, be, be away by that stage. Uh, but just to mention on the 12th of November, our next webinar is by Manuel Barcea, uh, Professor of Global History at the University of Leeds, and talking on the very relevant topic, uh, the yellow demon of fever, fighting disease in the 19th century transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we also want to talk, also like to advertise the 10th of December, uh, which is John Coffey, uh, who John has mentioned already in his talk, uh, who is doing a ma magnificent project on William Wilberforce's diaries, uh, and he'll be, he'll be uh, talking on an abolitionist diary, rethinking William, Wil William Wilberforce. Um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce or reintroduce to you Catherine Hall, uh, who was a Sydney Smith lecturer in 2013, uh, a longtime associate and friend of John Oldfield's, and of course, one of our most distinguished historians in this country uh, in 19th century history, uh, in the history of the middle class and gender history, and in the last, in the, in the last decade or so. Uh, particularly important in the history of empire, Britain's relationship to slavery, uh, and into both abolitionism and pro-slavery thought. Uh, she's working at, in addition to the many books uh, that she's that she's written already, she's working now uh, on the very interesting historian uh, and pioneering pro-slavery theorist um, Edward Long, uh, who wrote the history of Jamaica in 1774. Um, so I can now turn over to Catherine to give a commentary. Uh, on John's paper, and then we'll open up to the audience uh, for discussion and questions. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Trevor. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's a great pleasure um, to be invited to comment on John's uh, wonderfully um, engaging and interesting and broad ranging lecture. Uh, and I'd like to thank Trevor and the Institute for this invitation to be here and to celebrate John's work over such a long period and that's been so productive. So John has been writing new histories of abolition since the 1990s, books which have helped us to rethink this key period in British and Atlantic histories. This afternoon, as he invites us to imagine the challenges of the decade ahead, leading up to the bicentenary of the Demerara Rebellion and of Emancipation, and gives us glimpses of his new book, The Ties That Bind, it seems an excellent moment 
and the right place in the Wilberforce Institute, which he did so much to strengthen and which he continues to work with, to congratulate him on his achievement and reflect on the questions that he's raising. And today, particularly about the idea of an integrated history of British anti-slavery and what the possibilities are for that. And I would just say to you that I've only just heard this lecture, so I'm trying to think about it. I mean, obviously I've had some thoughts before about his work, but I'm also trying to think in the immediate as I comment, um, as I respond to what he had to say. John's first study, which he's mentioned, Popular Politics and British Abolitionism, looked at the popular mobilization around anti-slavery, taking attention away from the great white men, Clarkson and Wilberforce, and looking at the ways in which a movement was built, the significance of grassroots activism. How was the constituency for abolition created? How was anti-slavery placed at the center of political life? How important was the development of consumer society to all of this? Since then, as he himself puts it, his key themes, both in his monographs and in the edited collections, have been the building of movements and the significance of transatlantic and international abolitionism. And the ties that bind develops these themes. The second wave of abolitionism in the 1830s and 40s, as he has talked about today, was marked by deep Atlantic affinities. In the US, both black and white activists had great respect for Wilberforce and Clarkson and saw themselves as building on that British legacy. There were many common strategies across the two arenas, a focus on grassroots activism, the use of itinerant le lecturers, the pledging of candidates, and the engagement with electoral politics. But there were also distinctive US developments, the anti-slavery songs that he tracks and the narratives of the enslaved, which became such a vital form of communication of the experience of slavery to wide audiences. Frederick Douglass's 300 plus lectures across the UK, when he electrified audiences with his eloquence, are only one of the examples of the importance of these links across the Atlantic. There's a recent installation about Frederick Douglass in the UK by the black artist, Isaac Julian, which I would very strongly recommend to you all. I particularly liked in the book, the exploration of the friendship between William Lloyd Garrison and George Thompson, which survived across decades. It reminds us of the importance of friendship to the building of political movements, how people become emotionally bound to each other through shared commitments to social and political justice. John summarizes his lessons for today from his historical work. And here his, his emphasis is very much on the relation between past and present, the long durée that he talked about at the end of the lecture. The five points that he makes there, I think are all terrifically relevant to contemporary politics, as well as to uh, anti-slavery, the anti-slavery past. First of all, the importance of accepting difference in movements the possibilities of gaining strength through dialogue, not the uh, fixed certainties um, that can be so difficult in today's sometimes toxic uh, style of denunciation of others, driven by what Freud called the narcissism of minor difference. Let us think beyond that to what are the strengths that unite us. Secondly, he emphasized the importance of committed activists being integrated into decision-making. You can see how relevant that is today, again. Thirdly, he, strength, he emphasizes the importance of building a movement with structures and recognized forms of organization. And he asks the question, 
can social media bring institutional change? And I think we know what his answer would be. Then he also emphasizes the importance of a willingness to engage with electoral politics and, as you would expect from his lecture, a commitment to internationalism. So all these themes that he's drawn out in his work over these decades about abolitionism are so relevant to our understanding of the relation between the past and the present. I'd like to just add a further thought, and this connects, I hope, very much to what he has been talking about. John has been contributing for a long time to work on the rewriting of British domestic and imperial histories. Another of his books, which hasn't been mentioned, is Chords of Freedom, Commemoration, Ritual, and British Transatlantic Slavery. In that book, he discussed the version of history written by the Wilberforce brothers, which strongly attacked Clarkson, that narcissism of minor differences, undermining the history that Clarkson had written. And the Wilberforce brothers celebrated their father as a patriot, part of the establishment, embodying Christian humanitarianism and Britishness. There are, I suggest, particular responsibilities for historians in relation to the demand for reparations for slavery and for systemic racism across the centuries, which are being made both in the US and in the Caribbean and here and in parts of Africa. What has not been told about slavery and abolition? Where are the silences? What do people need to know of the moral debt which Britain owes to those formerly enslaved? How can it be repaired? Is it possible to repair it? Challenging the orthodoxy is essential. The orthodoxy created by a powerful tradition of history writing. New ideas about the significance of history writing emerged in the 18th century. Britain, it was thought, had a special place in the world and it was a providential place. History would vindicate virtuous actions whose virtue might not be apparent at the time. An all-seeing providence framed individual and collective actions. Trade, for example, was necessary to progress despite bringing evils in its wake. In the end, it would prove to bring progress, wealth, civilization to others. Historians from Clarkson and the Wilberforces onwards told the story of abolition as a humanitarian gesture by a number of great white men, a story of moral capital. They disavowed the significance of racial hierarchies and denied the significance of black rebellion. They told a story of progress and of Britain as leading that progress. We can see the continuation of this tradition through the 19th century, through Macaulay, through Mill, through Seeley, and of course into the 20th century, with progress justifying empire and its brutalities. A powerful tradition of British historians have justified empire and legitimated its brutalities in the interests of supposedly civilizing others. This thinking we can trace right into the late 20th century with the continued justifications for British intervention on humanitarian grounds as in relation to the war on Iraq. It is vitally important for critical historians to challenge this tradition write other stories, curate new shows and galleries in museums and in the work of public education, to stress the importance of popular mobilizations, to stress the historic alliances between black, brown and white people, between men and women, to develop 
what John is talking about as the integrated history of anti-slavery and abolition. John's body of writing is part of this work, and I would describe that as part of the work of what we might call reparatory history, a history which seeks to repair some of the damage which has been done by slavery, racisms, and empire. And without new understandings and a shifting public consciousness about questions of race, empire, and social justice, we won't be able to achieve any other kinds of reparations. That shift in public knowledge is essential to uh, fundamental change in terms of Britain's relationship to its erstwhile empire. So John talks of rethinking in terms of more a more flexible, inclusive, domestic and international uh, kind of history. And I would also say a history that takes on the question of racial hierarchies, which understands that that is not a matter just of the past, but of the past in the present, that abolitionists are not all innocent of that issue, and that, that those traditions of thinking about who matters and who doesn't matter, unfortunately, we can see still so present and alive in our current society. And we only have to think of the Windrush and the horrors that have been revealed around the treatment of the Windrush generation to look at the long, long history of forms of exclusion which originated in the system of plantation slavery. So I want to congratulate John and thank him for all the work that he's done. He talked so generously about the work that everyone else has been doing, which is indeed very, very important, but he is part of that new history writing that we so badly need. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, I think that we would all share those, those thoughts, particularly at the end, uh, about uh, just uh, both how generous John is to other, other colleagues in terms of uh, recognizing their work and how important his work is um, in advancing and changing our views uh, on this important topic. Um, we have a number of questions from uh, from from the audience. So if, if we can get John back on on to on, on here and keep Catherine here as well. Uh, but here are some some questions that from from colleagues, which I'll put forward to you. Um, the first comes from Andrew Connor, and he asks, "How did British public opinion affect the view of Americans on the slave trade?" Uh, if it did so at all. John, do you want to answer that? Mute. John, mute it. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, yep, yes, that's right. Okay. Um, uh, well, greatly, I think, uh, and in fact, this is where my, a lot of my work began. It was actually trying to understand how um, how British abolitionism impacted, or, or in terms of you know societies that emerged at around about the same time in the 1780s, how they interacted with each other, and how they impacted on each other. And I think in the early phases, there's no doubt that um, the British contributions had a huge impact, not least through writings. So. You look at Clarkson, for instance, his writings are reprinted and adopted by American abolitionists who use them in their campaigns. Uh, and that is a tradition that goes on. It's very interesting, I think, how um, the American movement, which is, which is, which is different, obviously, um, um, it's not a popular campaign, but it is, it's about petitioning, it's about strengthening regulations, how much that depended on a kind of rhetoric uh, that comes from Britain, and it comes in particular from people like Thomas Clarkson, who 
um, in my, to, to my mind, is, is a, still a, a, a neglected figure. And part of my work was actually about excavating Thomas Clarkson and plugging him into um, that sort of American tradition uh, of, of kind of protest. And, you know, it's very interesting how how they figures like Clarkson are appropriated by American abolitionists, not not just white abolitionists, but also black abolitionists. These are these are people who are highly venerated, and that's what I meant by those that idea of black Anglophilia, which I think again has been underestimated uh, in terms of a transatlantic discourse. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from John Coffey. This would be for both uh, for both for John and for Catherine. Um, John asks, would an analysis of abolitionist racial thought uh, be part of a, an integrated history? Um, he's thinking here of, of people like Thomas McCarthy and his work on the tension between liberal universalism and liberal developmentalism. As he mm. said, John notes that abolitionists rejected notions of inherent biological racial inferiority, but still thought as Catherine Hall explores in her work, but still thought in terms of ingrained cultural inferiority. So perhaps both John and Catherine might be, if you're willing, Catherine, uh, might be willing, able to, to talk about that particular subject. Um, well, again, I think, I think yes. And, and I think um, Catherine's right in, in her comments that really not enough attention has been paid to those questions about racial, racial hierarchies and how how abolitionists um, dealt with questions of difference um, and and how what place it has in their their thinking um, not least uh, and John will know about more about this than I do and not least uh, their religious thinking um, these are people who are deeply committed to notions about you know evangelical um, divine providence, national punishments, and all the rest of it. But um, very rarely do you get a glimpse of how racial difference plays into uh, those those questions and how agency. Um, uh, there is still, I think, a tendency within a lot of abolitionist thinking um, to think about the enslaved as people acted upon um, rather than acting. Which I guess is Marcus Wood's point, where he talks about you know, kind of the terrible gift of freedom, you know, that idea of emancipation as a, as a gift. So I do, I think John is right. There is, um, I think there is an. I mean, I didn't talk about this at great length. I think there's a need to revisit questions about religion and the re religious roots of abolitionism, but also to think more critically about racial uh, hierarchies uh, and how how people from Wilberforce down sort of dealt with some of those issues but dealt with but that's an inquiry I think which that shouldn't be present centered uh, I think it's about understanding these people in their own time and and how they dealt with some of those kind of issues I don't know Catherine will probably have more to say about that I think but <laughs> well I think all historical work is about understanding people in their own time but it's also about thinking about the ways in which those ideas have had reverberations you know, into the present. So that's what mm. I mean by the past in the present. I don't mean at all that we should use today's understandings yeah. to think about the past. But I mean, both in my work on the, which John Coffey has mentioned, in my work on the missionaries in Jamaica, you know, it's very clear that they thought about that most of them thought about enslaved Africans as benighted people who needed leading and guiding. And some had more progressive, what we would think of as more progressive, more egalitarian views of them. So William Nibb, for example, um, who was a central figure in Jamaica in the period of the abolition of slavery, he was a more egalitarian thinker. His daughter, um, you know, married uh, a man, a, a brown man, and they had mixed race children, which, you know, lots of people would not have touched at that time. So the importance of those kind of shifting ideas about race and some of the other missionaries were much more 
um, committed to their insistence on white leadership uh, than Nib was. So I think understanding the complexity of these shades of opinion and the differences uh, that are being argued about in very dramatic ways in Jamaica, um, in public confrontations in chapels between black and white Baptists. That's one of the kinds of ways you can get into that. I also worked on that in relation to Zachary Macaulay, who, you know, was, I mean, such a stalwart mm. in terms of the, you know, the endless work that he did on for the abolitionist cause. And yet, you know, he, he certainly didn't think that black and white people were equal. He thought that maybe one day they would be, but of course that's the kind of thinking about the future that many people engaged in. Only the thing was that day was never going to come. So the glacial slowness of the reaching that time of civilization. I mean, if you look about it in look at it in relation to Jamaica, it's all too telling. So I think there is a lot more work to be done on racial thinking and the forms of racialization that whether it's planters who come back to Jim from the Caribbean or uh, or missionaries who come back from the empire or you know all the people all the transatlantic travel and voyages and talk and information that's so important and that comes into Britain along with the numbers of black people that are here and are coming here as John has referred to it all of that, there's just so much more work to be done. Thank you very much. I've got, got a question from Natalie Peer. Um, could John elaborate on the odd relationship between Britain's increased investment in slavery after 1750 and its emergent moral capitalism, uh, leveraged in many ways by people like William Wilberforce? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that, Trevor? Um, well, can you elaborate on the relationship between Britain's increased investment in slavery uh, and mm. its emergent moral capitalism. In other yeah. words, that Britain was Britain was. I think what Natalie's meaning is that Britain is increasing its 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 import yeah. its its commitment to slavery at the same time. Uh, it's 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 having a, a form of moral capitalism which is against slavery, uh, at least yeah. in the words of, at least by people such as William Wilberforce. Yeah, no, sort of I think that, the sort of thing that David Brian Davis, I think, argued about. Yeah, others. Well. Yeah, you know, this is um in in some ways, I, I guess, a conundrum. Um, um, and I think it's about uh, teasing out some of those relationships, those strands in different forms of thinking. I mentioned evangelical religion, but there's been a lot written on sort of the ideas about um. You know, the rise of compassionate humanitarianism, whether whether it's this is about children, the sick, the insane, and so on. It's it's about um, I mean that as a kind of analysis. I think somebody mentioned consumption earlier. This is I think is an analysis which goes back to this question about you know the rise of a of a, uh, of a middle class in Britain that um, is increasingly leisured and has time to to think about these things and variations in thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, so there is a, an odd um, odd relationship, I guess, uh, between those two things, but they are necessary to each other, as, as, as I see it, that increasing commercialization, the rise, to, the rise of an urban civil, civil society, people who are thinking and debating about um, some of these questions, not least in relation to themselves and their own exclusion. So the way in which nonconformity plays into some of these issues. People who don't have the right to vote, can't, can't hold office, but nonetheless are wealthy and want to say, and how they find in reform activity generally, not just in questions about, the, about abolition, a means of exerting themselves and making themselves heard. Um, so that, if you like, is the, the, the kind of hidden history of, of, the, of that rise of a leisured middle class, which I think is increasingly vocal and willing to kind of put their shoulders to the wheel of something um, like a reform movement. Um, 
that may be I hope an answer to that to that question. Um, Great, thank you, and I, and I hope, Natalie, that I, I my reinterpretation of your question uh, kept to the original meaning of it. Um, we have a question. I mean, in, in, this I think connects in some ways to the next two questions connect in some ways to uh, what both of you have been talking about, what Catherine calls the relationship of the past to the present. Uh, we have one from Al Alexander Vogel who asks, "Do you see a connection between the history of the abolition of slavery uh, with a call for prison abolition, uh, at least in the United States, uh, or do you think this is too idiosyncratic a link?" <laughs> um, hmm. um, with that, yeah, without sort of wanting to go back and say, "Can you elaborate on that?" But but is, is that a question about? Well, if that's a question about incarceration as a yeah. form of slavery, is that? Yeah. It's so. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I don't think it's idios idiosyncratic. I think this is uh, this is again about the way in which um, social injustice works against uh, and kind of racial racialized ideas work against certain groups of people uh, and the need to to do something about it. Um, the question about um, if this is a question about mobilization however that's i think a, a, a different kind of issue and how you mobilize um, people against particular issues how you turn ideas into social movements is is particularly tricky and that's one of the things i was trying to get out in um the kind of conclusion to the ties ties that bind so you know there are i think those connections and I think on one of the the set the why I I sort of got addressed that issue is that that you know the uh, uh, abolition is seen as a kind of core in in term people who write about the history of humanitarianism abolition is a kind of core cornerstone of that kind of narrative um, and and therefore it's about how you can draw um, I was involved for some years in a project called the Anti-Slavery Usable Past, um, but it is about a kind of a notion of how you can take a protest memory and make it resonate in current situations and thinking about you know, how how was this done in the past, how can it how can it apply in the future? If I've understood the question correctly, I think uh, I think there is a there isn't anything. Uh, particularly idiosyncratic about that, but but actually quite sensible. It's not just about it's all it's about all reform, uh, I think, and how we how we change the society we live in, and we can draw you know, some important lessons, I think, from how abolitionists did this. Right. Thank you. With five. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Can I just go in on that? Because yeah. um, I think the you know I think the struggle for freedom is what connects these traditions yeah. and the incarceration uh, of African Americans in um, US prisons is such a shocking, shocking, shocking phenomenon. The scale of it is just unbelievable. And interestingly, I heard Angela Davis speaking a couple of weeks ago, and she has been campaigning for decades now on the question of incarceration. Um, sometimes there are three generations of African Americans uh, all incarcerated and they're working as prison labor uh, and it is virtually equivalent to slave labor. It's, it's a very, very shocking story. Anyway, what's interesting in this context is that she said, she talked about how in the wake of the George Floyd killings, the shift in American public consciousness about both race and incarceration has been quite remarkable and that for people like her who've been agitating on this for decades the change in the atmosphere in relation to police activity and um, prison incarceration was positively encouraging mm -hmm. and since we really really need hopeful things at the moment whether she's still as hopeful now as she was three weeks ago, <laughs> I have no idea. But but we certainly need points of hope yeah. in the present. 
Yeah, I mean, if I could just kind of come back to that, I, I do also, I mean, I do think there is a debate in the, in the United States at the moment, which, which I was thinking, I was reading recently Isabel Wilkinson's book on caste, which is a damning indictment of all of these things we've been talking about. It's not just the prison system and incarceration, it's about deeply ingrained injustices that may particularly experience or also experienced by black middle classes. Um, you know, so the, these are deeply entrenched issues, which obviously the Trump administration has in many cases exacerbated. And I think there is a, a groundswell of opinion, um, which is really, I think, starting to grapple with this in a very um, significant way. I think this leads us on to, to, um, to, things, to, to a couple of questions which very much connect with the present day. And I'll perhaps I'll say both of them. One's from uh, Sapsa Colding, and one is from uh, Nick Evans. Um, Saps and this is to both both speakers. Um, and Sapsa asks, it says that the recent Black Lives Matter movement has brought to life the need to acknowledge the long-lasting effects that slavery has around the world, and the lack of awareness of some people about the role that Britain plays in this, especially mm. in the Caribbean. Uh, what can we do to ensure that the full history is taught in schools rather than a whitewashed version? And I think something which is connected, which comes from Nick, so I'll put these both together, so I'll give you a chance to, 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 to address both of them. Um, a question from Nick Evans is that given the dramatic effect of events at Bristol and other cities in Britain this summer, um, will the museum uh, have any utility by the time of the 2033 bicentenary? Um, Catherine mentioned the importance of social media in life today, but should we now begin a conversation, Nick asks, about the most effective vehicles for engaging audiences with this challenging and problematic legacy. So I think I'd, I'd like to finish, I guess, with two questions which uh, lead you to speculate on, on the relationship of your engagement with the past, uh, with the various things we're, we're looking at in the present. So perhaps Catherine first and then John to finish yeah. off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, on the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which I've been working on for 10 years now, um, we have taken the question of public engagement absolutely essentially from the beginning. And part of that, of course, is working with teachers and with schools. Yeah. And one of the pleasures actually is knowing uh, the extent to which teachers are using the resource to, you know, just put into the website the area where their school is, for example and then bringing up material which they can give their students to follow and show how uh, these legacies are present all over the country in the most unexpected places. So the use of those maps that we've done and the fact that we've been able to uh, put in the addresses of as many slave owners as we can that got compensation and so on, I think that's been an important contribution. I mean, it's clear that people have been working for a very, very long time on this question about uh, the history in schools. And it's not just about black history, it's about white history and black history. It's about that integrated story that John was mm. talking about. So I think that's the first thing to say. Just what was the second bit of the question? Oh, about social media. Well, it's and the, so the museum and social media, yeah. The museum and social media. I mean, it's so interesting. When the days around the um, taking down the toppling of the Colston statue, we normally have on our website about 2,000 uh, hits a day on the website. At the time of the toppling of the Colston statue, we were getting between 50 and 60,000 hits a day, which is, of course, absolutely about social media. It's that people are tweeting you know, go and look at the LBS website. Now, the question is, what depth does any of that have? How long do people look at the website for? Does it actually, is it two seconds or is it a bit longer? Does it actually change anybody's mind? I mean, I think we just have to work and intervene at so many different levels, whether it's in schools, it's in museums, it's in whatever forms of uh, public education that are that are available to us and that's what again I'd come back to the fact that John has been done so much work in thinking about commemoration for example which you know that's so much a part of public understandings 
of history. So, of course, museums will go on mattering. Um, all of these things matter. There's just a lot of work to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would echo this. I, I think the, the outreach issue um, is, is an ongoing one, and I, and I, I you know, spent time talking to groups who, who feel you know, very much alienated by the kind of messages and messaging they're getting in schools. But I do think now, you know, now is, is a, a very rich moment. Uh, I mentioned the Black Curriculum Project. I think there's some really very, very interesting initiatives going on there. There's just more accessible things from, you know, David Olasaga's recent book aimed at children to uh, our own Angelina Robsborn and Patrick Vernon's 100 Great, Great Black Britons. There's, there's, a, there's an increasing amount of information which is available to teachers. There's work that the uh, Historical Association has been doing with people like Kate Donington uh, at London South Bank to train teachers how best to use things like LBS or, or indeed remembering 1807. So there are more. I think there are more resources, there are more ways of addressing those kind of issues, but but we need to get teachers on board with that. We need to actually, if you like, ease that, make it as easy as possible for them, who you know, hard pressed teachers to actually kind of take on board what we're suggesting and, and deliver what we think is an appropriate curriculum. Um, not just at school level, but also at university level. Uh, and I think that's another important issue. Museums, Nick, yes, I think that's huge. My point about social media was really about social, was about movements. Social, um, you know, does a, does a hashtag, maybe a hashtag may be okay for an event, but not for a movement. And part of the problem is that in terms of movements and thinking about movements, um, um, social media can be hijacked by people who can very quickly dismiss or undermine everything you're trying to achieve, achieve through false information. We know all about that. So, you know, social media is a hugely contested space and it's one you enter at your peril. Um, but, but social media um, properly used, yes. And museums, yes. And I think there's a huge amount of potential a lot of this is linked to resource, but for museums to uh, mount exhibitions which actually address what what are often perceived as difficult histories. Um, um, you know, a lot of those. One of the things that I'm increasingly thinking about and writing about is the fact that you know already those exhibitions put on in 2007 or 10 years old. Um, a lot of them are looking rather tired and, and, and lacking in sort of some kind of energy. Um, you know, how can museums deal with that? How can they take on board a lot of these new agendas um, without being adequately resourced? So they do need, they need our help, they need as much help as they can get. But yes, I think museums are or remain, uh, if that's the question, it remain extremely important vehicles for getting across this kind of integrated history that I'm talking about. And I think the, a lot of these special exhibitions that the ISM has been doing have been very effective. And some of the follow-up work that London Docklands have been doing is a hugely important, um, not least in terms of, not just in terms of the exhibitions themselves, but the, the work, you know, the formal education that goes on. Uh, that, that is put on by those museums on a regular basis. So, so yes, there's lots, there's, there's lots to be to be done, but there's a, there's an awful lot out there. And and going back to that question about the curriculum, I think um, this is a good moment um, in some some cases. You know, BLM has really energised huge huge amounts of activity. Uh, I think, um, and the amount of attention that um, these issues are getting speaks for that. Well, thank you very much, John. I have I have some few other questions. There's one I forgot from uh, Miss Al from Gad Human, but I'll send that to you separately, and some other questions as well. But I, I think that we that we've had a fantastic and stimulating conversation um, about uh, about the work that has preoccupied John for for many years, and and uh, it was it, it, it's been a very stimulating discussion in general. So uh, I'd like to thank you, thank both for Catherine very much for your commentary.
uh, and in particular, John, to thank you for, uh, for a superb talk uh, and something I think that all of us will go home thinking about. Um, just to reiterate at the end, a, a couple of messages, just to reiterate that we have two forthcoming uh, webinars, uh, one by Manuel Barcea in, in, in The Yellow Demon, Demon of Fever on the 12th of November, and John Coffey on, on Wil Wil William Wilberforce's Diaries on the 10th of December. Uh, and just to finally uh, close, we, we have had a, a message from, uh, from from Claire Colley of the Hull University, uh, Hull, Hull University um, uh, Students' Union, uh, who is the, who, who wants to mention that the Hull University Anti-Slavery Society uh, has been established and having their first meeting on Monday at 8 p.m. Uh, where, where the, the membership fee is, uh, is, is not hugely exorbitant, uh, four pounds per annum. Uh, and Claire, would, if, if you wish to do that, you'd be in touch with us um, at, at, at the Wilberforce Institute and we can get you in touch with Claire, with Claire Colley. Uh, but finally, just to reiterate our thanks to John uh, and to Catherine uh, for, the, for the superb seminar. Uh, and in particular, thank John uh, for, for the work that he's done as director of the Wilberforce Institute uh, for the book that he's just published uh, and for the really interesting talk today uh, on rethinking uh, abolition. Thank you very much.